Hello, hello. Okay, so uh, welcome to the last section. Uh, okay, so welcome to the last section today. Uh, there will be two talk in this section, and the the first talk is uh, on efficient KDM CCA secure public key encryption for polynomial function, and the authors are. Uh, Shuang Han, Sheng Li Liu in uh, Ling Liu. Okay, you are Ling Liu, right? Oh, Shuang Han will give the talk. Okay, yeah, please. Thanks for the chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to introduce our work. Um, the title of, of our work is Efficient KDMCC Secure Public Key Encryption for Polynomial Functions. Um, the authors are Shui Han, Sheng Li Liu, and Ming Yu. We are from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Um, we study key dependent message security in this work. Um, KDM security compared Compared with traditional security notion, um, it allows the, an adversary to assist encryptions of messages which are closely de dependent on the secret keys. <coughs> that is, the adversary may um, obtain the encryption of SK, FSK under the corresponding public key PK. This scenario may occur due to careless key management. For example, in, um, the backup key may be encrypted by the corresponding uh, backup system on the disk. Another situation um, for key-dependent message security um, is by design, and uh, the, it has applications in anonymous credential system. Recent years, there were there were many works devoted to um, to prove to give counterexamples showing that traditional security notions is uh, does not imply KDM securities and give the separations between these two security notions. Let us briefly review the public key encryption. Um, the Alice will generate a pair of public key and secret key, and uh, given the public key, Bob will encrypt the message M and send the resulting ciphertext to Alice. And Alice can decrypt the ciphertext with, his, uh, with her secret key. Uh, the KDM security, there will be N users, and the, cipher, and the adversary is given all the public keys. The adversary is also um, given uh, an encryption oracle. Each time, the adversary will submit a uh, function f and, uh, to some user. And the, the user, for example, the s user, will encrypt the f of sk1 to skn or encrypt a dummy message 0 under the public key pki and uh, then return the challenge ciphertext to the adversary. The target of the adversary is to distinguish encryptions of key-dependent messages from encryptions of dummy messages. This defines KDMCP security. As for KDMCC security, the adversary is also, uh, has also assist to a decryption oracle and submits a ciphertext to some user. And the S user will decrypt the ciphertext with, um, with SKI and return the decrypted message back to the adversary. This defines a KDMCC security. KDM security is related to a set of functions. Typ 
uh, f typical <coughs> function sets includes the set of selection functions and the set the set of affine functions and the set of polynomial functions of bounded degree d. The bottom line here is the larger the function set f is, the stronger the KDM security is. BHHO um, proposed the first um, KDM CPA secure PKE scheme in the standard model in 2008. However, the, their cipher test is incompact. It consists uh, group elements, the number is linear in the security, security parameter, L. <coughs> SAPS also proposed KDM CPA security, p secure PKE for affine functions, and the, the cipher texts are, <coughs> are compact. MTY provides a KDM CPA secure PKE for polynomial functions, and their cipher texts um, consists of all the um, of group elements. For the KDMCC secure PKE, there are few efficient constructions. Hoffens um, present, presented the first KD, efficient KDMCC secure, secure PKE with compact cipher tests. However, the function set only consists of um, functions of selection functions. In two, uh, recently, in 2015, LLJ pr um, proposed the first KDMCC secure PKE for affine functions. However, I will point out the security proof of their scheme is flawed. We will, we will explain this later. So in this work, we, we, we work on the design of KDMCC um, PKE scheme. We give the first efficient KDMCC secure PKE for affine functions with compact cipher tests. The cipher tests only consists only a constant number of group elements. And our scheme is very efficient. It, it is free of needs and free of pairing. We, we then extend our technique and for the first time um, construct the first efficient KDMCC secure PKE for polynomial functions. And the cipher test is almost compact. So let's first review the LLJ scheme. The LLJ scheme was claimed to be KDMCC secure for affine functions. One essential building block called authenticated encryption, or AE bar, is employed in their construction. And the KDMCC security of the LLJ scheme heavily relies on a so-called INTF affine RK security of the AE, AE bar. And, and however, the INTF affine RK security proof of the LLJ's AE bar does not go through to the DDH assumption smoothly. Um, LLJ's A bar can be regarded as L gamma type. Uh, in order to reduce the INTRK security to the DDH assumption, we need to be, um, construct a DDH problem solver who, who is given a DDH tuple or a random tuple and simulates the INTRK security game for the adversary of AE bar. Finally, the adversary of AE bar will output a forgery. However, the DDH problem solver who does not have, uh, who does not have any trapdoor is not able to convert the um, forgery from the adversary to a decision bit efficiently. And the failure of the INTRK security of LLJ's AE bar in turn affects the KDMCC security of the LLJ scheme. Then we show our approach to KDMCC secure PKE by introducing a new primitive called authenticated encryption with auxiliary inputs. <coughs> a possible solution um, is to construct a, a new AE with a sound INTRK security. 
and we build such a, a new AE called AIAE following Kurosawa decimal type. However, a new problem arises. The, sec the security game of our AIAE consists of four elements, and uh, a fine fun a fine function of k is too complicated to prove the INT f, um, f affine RK security. <coughs> um, our solution is to introduce a new primitive called authenticated encryption with auxiliary inputs. Um, it generalizes the traditional uh, authenticated encryption in two aspects. The first different place is um, AIE must support auxiliary inputs. In order to encrypt a message M, Bob will Bob Bob needs to pick a uh, auxiliary input AUX and uh, send both the ciphertext and the auxiliary inputs to Alice. And with the uh, auxiliary inputs, Alice can decrypt the ciphertext with his with her secret key. The second dif difference place is we introduce a new security notion for AIAE called weak INTFRK security. It has an additional special rule for, for checking the forgery. In the security game defining weak INTFRK security, the adversary um, can submit a function F, a message M, and an auxiliary input AUX to a user, and the user will encrypt the message M with auxiliary input AUX under the related key FX and send the ciphertext back to the adversary. Finally, the adversary will output a forgery consists um, a function F star, ciphertext um, AIE CT star, and uh, AUX, AUX star. <laughs> the adversary succeeds if the decryption of AIE CT star with auxiliary input AUX uh, X standard under F, F star K does not fail, and uh, the forgery must satisfy the special rule. <coughs> then we prove the weak INT RK security of our AIE with respect to a smaller function set um, called restricted affine function set. Uh, um, the weak INT RK security of our AIE can be reduced to the DDH assumption smoothly because the DDH problem solver can sample the trapdoor itself and uh, um, turns the forgery from the adversary of AIE to a decision bit efficiently. Then we show our method to construct KDMCC security, secure PKE for affine functions. Um, we stress that our AIE only achieve a very weak INT-RK security for a small function sets. So we cannot apply the LLJS method to construct KDM CC secure PKE for fine functions. Alternatively, we, um, we develop a new approach and build our PK, PKE from three building up blocks. <coughs> a key encapsulation mechanism, KEM, a public key encryption scheme, E, and our AIAE. The encryption algorithm of our scheme um, is, shown, is shown here. The KEM will encapsulate a key K for AIAE, and the, and the resulting encapsulation KEMCT will serve as, a, serve as a auxiliary input for AIAE. And the encryption, and the encryption of M uh, using the algorithm E, encryption algorithm of E will be served as uh, an input for AIE. And AIE will use the key encapsulated by KEM to encrypt E, the ciphertext of E, with auxiliary input stated as KEM CT. And the decryption algorithm is symmetric. The KEM, the KEM will decrypt the ciphertext to re recover the encapsulated key K, and with the key K, AIE can decrypt AIE CT to recover an E CT. And finally, the message M can be recovered. 
we, sh <coughs> we show the highly proved idea of uh, about how to prove our KDM CC security for fine functions. Um, we will divide the secret key SK to two independent parts, the blue part SK module N and the gray part SK module 5 of N. The first, uh, first, we will use the secret key SK instead of PK to answer the encryption queries made by the adversary. Then we will change the encryption algorithm of E to E bar under the DCR assumption, such that the encryption algorithm of E bar can behave like a, an entropy filter for a fine functions, such that the blue part SK module N is reserved. That means um, the cipher test ECT only contains information about SK module file van. We also change the, uh, <coughs> the encryption algorithm of KEM to KEM bar under the DCR assumption. We express the encapsulated key K as an restricted affine function of a fixed base key K star. And in KEMCT, we, um, the blue part SK module N will pro protect the base key K star. Our goal is to uh, ensure that the blue part um, is not used elsewhere so it can protect the base, base key K star in KEMCT perfectly. So we turn to the decryption oracle to uh, make to ensure it does not use the uh, blue parts. First, the, the decryption of KEM uh, is changed to KEM tilde, which rejects the decryption query if the computation of K uh, involves the blue parts. By the weak INT um, RK security of our AIAE, we can show this change is computationally indistinguishable. Then we change the decryption algorithm of E to E bar, and uh, uh, it will reject the decryption query if the computation of M involves the blue part. And thanks to the authentication functionality of our building block E, we can show this change is also computationally indistinguishable. So now the decryption oracle does not use the blue part SK, SK module N at all anymore. Then we back to the encryption oracle and replace the and express E or and express K and restricted affine functions of an independent independent base key K star bar. Since in the encryption algorithm of E and the decryption oracle the blue part is not involved, so in KMCT the base key K star um, can be can can perfectly hide it by SK module N. Finally, we change AIAE CT as an encryption of zero uh, a dummy message zero instead of ECT because K is an Restricted the fine function of k star k star bar, which is in independent of other parts of the game. So by the IND RK security of our AIE, and this change is also computationally indistinguishable. Now the advantage of the adversary is zero. This uh, this shows the KDM CC, CC security of our scheme for uh, fine functions. Then we show how to extend our technique and build KDM CC secure PKE for polynomial functions. Uh, we, uh, we design a new building block E, which serves as an entropy filter for the polynomial functions. That means through some computational indistingu indistinguishable change, the blue part can be reserved by the encryption of if, uh, E. And thanks to our approach, we only need to design a new E, and the other two building blocks, KEM and AIE, um, does not need to change. As an example, we show how to design E for mo this monomial. 
嗯嗯。So I I skip this part and、uh, just to show the general E. Um, we show how to design a general E for polynomial functions. A, poly, a polynomial function f、um, in S K consists on the same、uh, many terms. For each monomial, say the encryption algorithm will create a pair of table and、uh, a corresponding V. The products of this V are used to hide the message、uh, in E. Under the DCR assumption, the encryption algorithm of E is changed to tilde E tilde such that each V is,、uh, is multipl multiplied with an additional term. The additional additional term is T to the minus of this monomial. Consequently, in the calculation of E, the pro the products of these additional terms will el eliminate. The message t to the fsk completely. Therefore,、uh, the epsilon to、uh, the e, e to the behaves like an entropy filter for polynomial functions, because the entropy of sk modulo n is reserved.、Uh, so this concludes our work. In this work, we propose a new approach for constructing KDMCC secure PKE. From three building blocks, KME and a new primitive called AIAE. By designing specific building blocks, we construct efficient KDMCC secure PKE for affine functions and for polynomial functions. And the ciphertext of our schemes are compact. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. So, is any question or comment for the authors? Okay. So, okay, no question. So, let's speak again. Okay. Okay, so we moved the last talk for today, and the title of this talk is "Structure Projecting Smooth Projective Hashing," and the authors are Oliver Bridge and Shading Chavaria. Okay, and、uh, Oliver will give the talk, please. Okay,、uh, thank you for the introduction. So I am Olivier Blasi from the University of Limoges, and this is a joint work with Céline Chevalier from Paris Two. And as the title said, I am going to speak about structure preserving smooth projective hashing.、Mm -hmm. So to give an overview of the talk, first I'll try to present the general context of、uh, protocol in the UC framework, why we want to do that, and what, our, what we are trying to improve. Then I'll recall、uh, two of the main tools that we are going to use.、Uh, To do our construction, then I'll explain what I mean by structure preserving smooth projective hashing, and give some examples of the construction, and then provide application to show that、uh, indeed this new primitive is useful and is going to have some、uh, and is improving the state of the art. So, in cryptography, we have many protocols where you have conditional action. So, for example, as we viewed earlier, you have a Blaise transfer. Where a user wants to retrieve a line in the database, and is going to commit in some way to his line, send it to a server. The server is going to provide an answer, and the user, if everything goes well, goes correctly, is going to be able to obtain the line he requested. And we want two properties. On one hand, the user only learns one line, the line he requested, and the server learns nothing. So that's some sort of conditional action. It means that. If indeed the user requested only one line, the user is able to retrieve this line. So another family of、um, conditional action is going to be、uh, authenticated key exchange. For example, in case of a password key exchange, Alice is going to send a function of a password with a broad definition of function, 
and Bob is going to provide an answer using his password and possibly the first row. So once again, it's a conditional uh, exchange. If both users send, send the correct password, they're going to obtain a shared key at the end. And otherwise, uh, they're not going to obtain the key. Nobody is going to learn which password was tried. Uh, and it's neither uh, someone outside the protocol or the other user. So in a broad sense, we have many protocols where we have two participants that are going to exchange information. And there should be a result in the end if something went correct. So we want to do that in the UC framework. So to remind a little that what was said earlier, um, the UC framework provides a functionality that say, in a perfect world, my protocol should do that. And now I'm going to show that my protocol can be transposed is equivalent to this functionality. So uh, let's consider the previous example where we have only two, two flows. First, we need to be able to say the adversary just stayed that. So if the adversary sends the first row, we should be able to extract the first row. So that sets a hard requirement. The first, row sh the first row should be extractable in some way. Then let's assume the first user is honest. So we are playing. We send something. And at this step, the functionality is going to tell us, you should have sent that. So we need it some way to be able to make sure that the first flow is equivocable so that the first row can be adapted to be what we were supposed to send and not what we sent really. And as we allow adaptive correction, that means in the middle of the protocol, the adversary can come and say, now this an, I'm corrupting this honest user. Give me everything he has in memory. And that should um, fit to what was say, uh, sent before. And so in some way, we should be able to adapt uh, memory. So we allow erasure, erasure but we, what remains in the memory should still fit what uh, is seen by the adversary. So the classical way to do that is to use scalars in the memory, such so as going to be the randomness used in the ciphertext, or mostly randomness used everywhere. And so the problem with scalars, especially on elliptic curve, is that you no longer have any trapdoor possible. And so, the, so it's not really the only way. But the main way is to do partial erasure, so that you are going to keep some randomness, but not everything. And that's partly inefficient. So what we propose in this talk is to keep in memory only group elements. So the nice thing about group elements is that you have extra trapdoors. Your simulator, as we are going to be um, considering the proof, might be able to work using the discrete logarithm, but uh, should only provide a group element. So this gives you a little more freedom. And when we proposed this idea, we were hoping that this would allow us to provide more interesting features. So uh, to do our construction, we are going to use mostly two tools. So first, an encryption scheme. That's the base of the first row. So you have the four classical algorithms, the setup, the key gen that gives you a public and a secret key. The encryption algorithm, so that's use the public key, the message, and some randomness. So the randomness is important here because it's going to be your witness later. And the decryption algorithm that takes uh, the cipher text, the decryption key, and returns the plain text. So in terms of security, we are going to consider in CCA2 games. So this means that uh, the cipher text should be secure even if the uh, adversary has access to decryption uh, or records. So we are also going to use most projective function. functions. So, um, to remind a little of the definition, so this was introduced in 2002 by Kramer and Schupp. So you're going to consider a family of functions that are defined over a domain X. And uh, more precisely, you are going to consider a subset in this domain that's going to be uh, what you call a language. So that's going to be a set of words that verify some property. And there, where there exists a witness W, that indeed proves that the word verifies this property. So you want the function to be evaluated in, in two ways, either through private evaluation using a secret hashing key HK. So you compute directly a hash of a, using HK on the world, or through a public evaluation that use a projected key HP that's defined with the, the use of HK. And here, if you use the, the public projection key, the word, and the witness, you should be able to compute a value, a value h prime. And if everything goes well, h prime should be equal to hx. 
So in terms of security, um, so far, sorry. So first, your function h using the secret evaluation key can be computed on any word in the domain, while the project x function can, can only be evaluated on word in the language because you need a witness, a proof that you belong to the language. So in terms of security, you have the smoothness. So this means that if your word is not in the language, then someone not knowing the secret key should not be able, in any way, to compute the hash value. So they should be uh, independent in a theory of information sense. Well, if the word is in the language, but you don't know the witness, so you assume that there's some kind of subset, uh, of a hard subset assumption, then the not knowing the witness means that the hash value is pseudo-random, so you should not be able to compute it uh, without breaking the underlying assumption. So here we are going to consider what we call structure preserving SPHF. So that's in the same way as the structure preserving signature. So we are going to force lots of value to be group elements. So here's the domain, it's a collection of group elements. The language, again, it's a collection of group elements. So you can think of a solution to a pairing equation to a pairing product equation. Now, uh, your words are going to be group elements. The really new part is that the witness are going to be group elements. So this means that the hash value you compute is uh, an element in the target group. The projected hash is also a value in the target group. So you might want to have the hashing key to be a group element. That's not really needed for our, our application because as far as I know, there are no smooth projective hash functions where you use an extra trapdoor on the secret hashing key because um, at least there's no reason to do so for now. That could be an interesting feature to develop later. So why we want to do that? It's really, we want witnesses to be group elements. This gives us so much freedom that it's really, it will be much easier to do simulation later on. So the important part is that if we have group elements, then we can use gross style proof. So we can use uh, witnesses that are zero knowledge. So we can simulate witnesses to answer our problem. And this also means that we are compatible with uh, quasi-adaptive music and many new features around that. So what you have to, remi to remember from this talk is that now witnesses can, can have turned out. So let's give some abstraction. It's the only ugly slide uh, in this talk, I promise. So what we had before is smooth projective hash function, and most of them can be adapted directly to structure preserving smooth projective hash function. The main point being the witness that was before a scalar that's now an element in G2. So just to explain a little the notation, so the word is an element in G1, where you use the witness on the group, public group, a group element. So the witness before was a scalar, now it's an element in G2 raised to the witness. Your HK, here I took the scalar definition. HP, it's the public group element at the beginning times, uh, times uh, raised to the hashing key, so that doesn't change in both worlds. So the hash, it's the public word uh, raised to the hashing key, while uh, on structure preserving uh, SPHF, you do a pairing uh, computation. And the project hash is the same thing, but using the witness and the NHP. So what you can see is that uh, here, on the hash line, you use a uh, hashing key as a scalar. But in fact, you can define HK to be uh, F composed with uh, lambda. And that would also work. And here, you would have uh, HK to be a group element. So let's give a toy example so that uh, the notation are more easy to follow. So we, can, we consider the previous language of uh, valid uh, Diffie-Hellman quadruple. So you have H and G that are public elements. So your word is going to be a pair of elements, hopefully H to the R, G to the R. So before your, witnesses, your witness was the uh, random scalar R. Now it's going to be uh, G2 to the R. You compute lambda and mu that are two scalars. HP is the base element raised to, the, to HK, so it's H lambda times G mu. Here, you do exactly the same thing for the structure preserving computation. The hash is the word, so HR and GR raised to, the, to HK. From the, for the structure preserving and SPHF, you do that but with a pairing. And what I said earlier is that 
In fact, you could have for HK d2 to the lambda and d2 to the mu and compute exactly the same value. And you have the projected hash that's once again computed using HP and R or HP and the new witness d2 to the R. So why are we doing that? Simply because this means that all the SPHF can be, for a tremendous part of them, transformed into structure preserving SPHF. So that's not uh, primitive, that's not intentionable. But we can also see that the reverse transformation may be hard. Because sometimes when you are going to compute a value, so think uh, zero knowledge proof, you are going to have a group element where you don't necessarily know the um, discrete logarithm. So you cannot move from, from a structure preserving SPHF to, to a SPHF. So, okay, now we can instantiate that. So we know that there are all the SPHFs that are verify this new property. What we show in the paper is how to build new SPHF, new structure preserving SPHF. So what are we going to do with such a primitive? So there are many generic constructions that allow us to instantiate the protocol in the UC framework. So for example, obvious transfer, so I'm not going to repeat uh, um, what I said earlier, but still you have a user a server and uh, the user should learn only a line, the server should learn nothing. So to do so, so I'm just simplifying the construction because you have uh, one tree flow that's here just for the proof. So you, the user is going to pick a line, do a UC commitment to this line, so we just expect the UC commitment to be uh, smooth structure preserving, smooth projective as function friendly. So he's going to do this UC commitment, keep uh, the decommit information D, He's going to send C to the server, to the, so the commitment, and keep only the decommit information and erase everything else. For each line, the server is going to compute uh, a pair of hash, hash key and projected hash. The hash value for the language, this is uh, the, the first commitment was the commitment to the line, to the line I. Uh, I, the line I, by the hash corresponding to the language of commitment to a line I, send that and the HP to the user. For the line that was committed, the user is able to compute the projected hash because he possesses the witness, the decommit information D. So he's going to be able to compute the same values as the one computed by the server. And for the line I, he's going to be able to recover the value of the line. And for the other, it's going to be completely random thanks to the smoothness. So he is not going to be able to compute the correct value. So another example, it's for Paik. The user, the, both users are now going to be able to compute an encryption, a UC commitment, a SPHF friendly for the password using some randomness. Keep the decommit information. So you have nice properties on SPHF. When you compute the projected key for some of the SPHF, you don't need to use, uh, to know the word beforehand to compute the, to compute HP. So what we show in the paper is that in fact, those KV HPHF can be transformed into KV structure preserving SPHF. We have uh, the property that's directly inherited. So you can compute that directly on the first flow. And both users are going to send CI and HPI, so the um, projected keys for the language. The other user is sending a commitment to the password I am expecting. They keep the decommit information and the hash key, and they raise everything. And now they do a, an evaluation of the SPHF on the language they committed and on the language they are expecting. And if everything goes well, once again, they are obtaining the same value. The last example of generic transformation using SPHF and uh, in the UC framework. So the user, is, let's assume that uh, you want to send a message to someone that has some credential. You want the property that this person can only obtain the message if indeed he has this credential, but you want some uh, kind of reverse anonymity where the server is not going to learn whether the person in front of him possesses this credential or not. So the user is going to do a UC commit to his credential. Once again, he's only keeping the decommit information. The database is going to do an evaluation, uh, smooth projective hash function, on the language of this credential verifies the property I am expecting. Recover hash value, hide the message using this hash value. And the server is going to send the projected key associated with the language, the max value. And the user 
is going to process in the witness, is going to compute the projected hash, obtain normally the hash value that was used to mask, and then recover the message if indeed it's credentials for verifying this property. So all, the, all this example have one strong requirement is that we are able to compute uh, SPHF, to have a SPHF friendly UC commitment. So there are many examples of uh, commitment with this information, but only one of them has the nice property of uh, having uh, decommit information being a group element. So we are going to focus on the FLM11 decommitment, uh, commi UC commitment. So from a high level, this paper does a linear Kramer Shoop encryption of some word M. And then the important part is that they do a gross high proof of knowledge of the exponent of the randomness used in the encryption to, uh, to achieve the UC security. And uh, thanks to the gross high proof, they are able to equivocate their commitment if need be. So uh, why are we interested in that? So on one hand, the nice thing is that here the decommit information is a group element. But also the other part is that contrary to uh, classical UC commitment where you keep scalars in the end, here um, your commitment is not uh, linear in the size of uh, what you are committing. You are committing to one group element and you don't grow uh, in the size of the database or the size of the password. So what we achieve? So for OT scheme, we can see that um, we obtain uh, something that's linear in the, number, in the size of the database. So that may seem a little less efficient than the scheme from uh, Azure Crypt uh, 13. But in fact, uh, in this case, the user, so the first flow, is going to be constant size. And is only go so it's going to be uh, four elements in G1 and four elements in G2. And only the server is going to have a, linear, uh, a flow that's linear in the size of the database. So this means situation where the user has a small emitting power, this might provide some uh, interesting uh, transformation. And we can also see that uh, with a non-tailored example, just applying our framework directly on existing scheme, we can obtain something that's roughly equivalent to what exists already. So another interesting comparison is for PAIC. So we compare to some of the existing scheme. So here you have schemes that are adaptive or run uh, UC secure with adaptive correction or one run scheme. So what we can see is that except for the GR15 scheme, which is somewhat special, our scheme ended up being more efficient than what already exists. So one has to know that the GR15 is not really following the same construction of the, than the other. They are using only quasi-adaptive uh, NISIC proof, not uh, SPHF. Uh, approach. So one might expect our scheme uh, to be a little improved in the sense that here we are using uh, plain old uh, gross uh, NISIC proof. If you use quasi-adaptive technique, you might reduce the factor 2 to a factor 1. And the main difference is that they manage to do uh, the two evaluation in one. So that's the extra element in G2 that we lose. Um, when we do our presentation, we also show how to instantiate our scheme not only in the 6 dh but uh, under every kind of matrix assumption. So that's mostly linear algebra. And the idea is that of a matrix assumption is that you can uh, transform, uh, you can transform a DDH assumption, a Delin assumption, or anything, in the sense of uh, I am in the span of a uh, matrix or not. So this allows us to give us to give a framework for everything. So. And DDH was compatible with uh, CCA2 commitment. We show how to instantiate FLM under MDDH. And then uh, now we can do a structure preserving smooth projective hash function under MDDH. OK? So let's try to sum up. So, first, we provide a generic transformation. So, we keep the security. So, this means that uh, if the SPHF was secure under uh, Delin assumption, then the corresponding structure preserving SPHF is going to also be secure on the Delin assumption. We keep all the extra properties. So this means that if the SPHF was such that the projection key could be computed without knowing the word, then the associated structure preserving SPHF could be computed the same way. The main part of this uh, construction is that now we can use NISIC as, as witnesses. So this is really important because 
this means that we can do more. Our simulator is more powerful than before. And so we are avoiding some problem with the UC framework. The idea is that if we naively plug uh, this framework with uh, existing building blocks, we obtain efficient protocol. So they are not always better than what exists already, but we manage to have roughly the same efficiency without trying to tailor the uh, approach in any way. And the nice thing, because uh, everything uses only linear properties, is that the construction can be transposed to the matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. So we can uh, adjust the security of our scheme like we want to rely on uh, other assumptions. Thank you. OK, uh, questions or comments? So, no questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.
有没有？
Hai, halo saat 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 saat. Halo, halo mod hai, halo mod. Saat 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 saat, halo mod hai, mod hai, mod hai, halo mod hai. Halo mod hai, mod hai, halo mod hai. Alo, một, hai, một, hai, alo, một, hai Alo, một, hai, một, hai mic này cũng là được nhưng mà nói như này này thì cậu nhìn đâu âm thanh ra đây nhưng mà không vào được nếu như mic mà để để cái cái bản thân cái cái này này cái này thôi hay là chỉ là do cái mic thôi chứ phải do cái âm ly âm ly là một phần thôi bây giờ nha tớ test mic cho cậu xem nhá bây giờ tớ nói mà cờ nói rõ nhỉ thì cậu thử nghe kêu nghe có ổn không nhá đấy ví dụ như này để góc này vậy vậy mình chỉ cần mua cái tay tay mic này thôi này mua cái 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 chân mic này thôi chân mic cài tay tay to này là cắm vào máy tính tắt livestream rồi, tắt livestream đi rồi.